Gravity hot water heat was great, <clears throat> but as it got older, since it was open to the atmosphere, you had a lot of corrosion going on in the system. So the system began to corrode and you get all these nooks and crannies on the inside of the pipe and something had to be done. We had to have a, an improvement. So, so we get the, uh, we get the circulator, which shows up in 1923 and it's invented simultaneously in America and also in, in Europe, in Germany. In Germany, it's invented by a company that comes to be called uh, Vilo, W-I-L-O. And in America, it's invented by a man named Homer Thrush, who would work with Mark Honeywell from time to time. So Homer Thrush gives us the first circulator and it's a, it's a vertical inline circulator. So the motor sits above the pump body and he had big flanges on it because it was designed to go on to a gravity hot water heating system on the return side for a couple of reasons. First of all, the water was cooler on the return side and that was better for, the, for this pump. And second of all, uh, Homer Thrush's original circulator had a packing gland, not a mechanical seal. So the packing gland had to drip all the time and it had to be near a floor drain. So it became normal to install the Thrush circulator on the return side, pumping back from the system and into the boiler. And by doing this, they sped up the way the water was moving and it, it added years of, of service to the gravity hot water heating system, which had been corroding. So a little bit of time goes by and a company out of Chicago uh, called Bell & Gossett is in business and they're, they're selling uh, just a side-arm heater for coal-fired boilers. And it's called an Excelso heater and it was just a, an iron uh, shell and it had a copper tube in it and it too worked by gravity just to heat, just to heat hot water. Uh, Taco in, in uh, Rhode Island was doing a, simil a similar thing, selling a similar product. In fact, Taco stands for the Thermal Appliance Company, and it comes from that original idea of having a sidearm heater to heat hot water. So both of these companies start looking at, uh, at this idea of, of, uh, of what Homer Thrush was doing, and, and Bell & Gossett first comes up with this idea of what they call a booster, which they trademarked as a name. It was quite clever. That was done by a man named Ed Moore, who was their marketing guy. And because they called it a booster, it, it said what the thing was going to do. It was going to boost the heat in an old gravity hot water heating system. And it was designed again to pump down into the boiler because that's where the water was coolest. You see, but this, this pump from Bell & Gossett had a mechanical seal here. It didn't need a packing gland. It worked on a mechanical seal. So it didn't have to be near a floor drain. It also didn't have to be set for so many drips per minute. So it was, it was more trouble free. It did need to be oiled here and on the motor. But, but it, was, it was a lot better than what Thrush was offering, so it became very popular. And they put this on the return side for the main reason that the water was coolest there, because their mechanical seal was made from a material called uh, carbon and another material called remite. So you've got this carbon ring that's spinning on this very hard material called remite, but the remite could not take very hot temperature. So the B&G people figured that if they put the circulator on the return, it would be better for the mechanical seal. And that's the only reason why it wound up there. Fast forward a couple of decades, and now we're into the 1960s, and, and uh, John F. Kennedy gets elected president, and he declares, uh, because of the, because of, uh, the Soviets and, and the, uh, the Cold War, uh, we're going to put a man on the moon before the end of the decade and bring him back safely. And, and this, this forms NASA, and NASA tries to figure out how we're going to do this, and we have the Gemini space program begins, and all this stuff actually has an effect on circulators because to make space capsules come back to the atmosphere, you've got to have some material that can take very high temperature. And they begin to look to companies that could develop ceramics that could take high temperatures. And the company that, that stands out above all others with this, believe it or not, is Coors, uh, the Colorado Brewing Company. Uh, Coors made all the, all the ceramic tiles for the space shuttle. So this was, this was a company that, that was prom, you know, prominent in this. And we begin to see these ceramic uh, tiles coming out and ceramic uh, is, is very good for, for mechanical seals as well. So before long, the people that make mechanical seals said, let's get rid of the remite and replace it with, with ceramic. So as soon as that's done in the early 60s, we now have circulators that could take 225 degrees Fahrenheit continuously and 250 degrees intermittently. So that's way beyond the range of any temperatures that we're using. I mean, we usually go up to 180 and that's it. So from the very early 1960s on, there is no reason anymore for this circulator to be mounted on the return side of the system other than it, it's a habit. And it's, it's a habit that people accept. And also, uh, with the building boom that takes place in the 1950s, we begin to see the development of packaged boilers. 
The package boiler has the controls attached to it and the circulator as well. And the nice thing about that, if, if you're a contractor, is it's easier to install because everything is all put together. And the boiler manufacturers are getting a great deal on these circulators because the, the people that make the circulators almost give them away to the boiler manufacturers, figuring that down the road, when the circulator fails as time goes by, and it'll probably fail many times, it's going to be replaced with the same circulator. So they want to get in there first. It's kind of like selling razors. You know, you don't make the money on the razor, but you're going to make it on the blades. Or you don't make the money on the printer, but you're going to make it on the ink. So, so the, the circulator manufacturers give the boiler people this great price, and you start to see the circulators getting installed. And they're all installed on the return side because it makes the packaging easier. The circulator's down at the bottom. Uh, the box can be shorter. You can get more of them stacked in a warehouse. You can get more of them on a truck. So again, habit and packaging kick in, and this is why circulators are on the return. But from this point on, there's really no reason to have them there. Now, another thing's taking place at the same time. On, on a larger scale, we, we have uh, working in the engineering field, uh, contract uh, or engineers that are, that are doing big apartment buildings now after World War II. It's a huge building boom in the 1950s. And they stop using steam in favor of hot water. So you start to see this big move in hot water. And you also see the, the, the great use of what we call these diverter teas or what Belling, Bellingasset called the monoflow tea or Taco called the Venturi tea because that allows for a less expensive installation which is comparable to one pipe steam. So you got one pipe diverting water through a radiator. But when you go into really big buildings with, with that system, you find that the pressure drop through the T's is cumulative because all the water is flowing through all the T's. So you wind up with some pretty big pumps that have to move the water through all these monoflow T's or all these Venturi T's throughout the system. And naturally the engineers going by habit were specifying these really big pumps to be installed on the return side of the system where the water was coolest even though there was no reason to do that anymore because we now had this ceramic mechanical seal. So a few years go by and they begin to see massive boiler failures and the failures are being caused by oxygen corrosion. Something is letting air into these systems and it's just eating the iron and the seal in these boilers. So nobody understands what's going on until a man named Gil Carlson comes along and Gil Carlson was my teacher when I was growing up through, through uh, the rep agency. We represented Bell and Gossett at the time. And Gil Carlson was, was the guy that taught me hydronics. And he writes this very famous paper uh, for ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating and Refrigeration Engineers, and uh, Heating and Refrigeration Air Conditioning Engineers. And ASHRAE is as close to science as we get in the heating industry. And, and Gil writes this, this paper where he explains that these, these high head pumps that are producing a lot of pressure mounted on the return side of the system pumping toward the boiler are causing a drop in pressure that's sucking air into the system and that is the air that is eating the boilers and that air is then getting spit out of the system by air separators on the supply side. So the whole engineering community worldwide pretty much goes aha uh -huh, and they, they realize that he's right and they move the circulators to the supply side pumping away from the compression tanks. Not so much from the boiler but the compression tanks and I'll tell you a lot more about this as we go along. This knowledge never really filters down into the packaged boiler business and the, and the residential business and the light commercial business. Contractors keep doing what they're doing. And then this is what leads to problems as we roll into the 1970s and the small high-speed water lubricated circulators show up on those jobs. And to understand why this happens, you got to think about the way an impeller works in a centrifugal pump. Centrifugal pump works by centrifugal force. So it's spinning to the right here, counterclockwise, uh, as you see in a direction. This is the eye, this is the inlet to the impeller, and you're looking at it dead on. It's kind of like the eye of a hurricane. So when it spins, it throws out the water by centrifugal force. You get a low pressure point here in the middle and a high pressure point at the outlet side. And since water is not compressible and the system is completely filled and under pressure, being held at there by the compression tank, if you move one drop of water anywhere in the system, it's like moving one link on a bicycle chain. If you move one link, all the links move at the same time. So in a heating system that's closed to the atmosphere, if you move the water through the circulator, everything in the system is going to move. It's like one big Ferris wheel. So knowing that, if you look at the way this thing works, you can see this, this uh, pickup and speed, the centrifugal force on a gauge as, as a change in pressure. As a, diff, as a delta P, difference in pressure. So here, for example, if we have a gauge on the suction side that reads 15 PSI, 
and then a discharge 25 psi that means that this circulator is producing a pressure differential of 10 psi now 1 psi is equal to 28 inches of water column or 2.3 feet of pump head 28 inches or 2.31 feet so if we take 10 times 2.31 we get 23 feet of head so now if we wanted to know how much water was flowing with this circulator we would go on the manufacturer's pump performance curve which looks like this it's showing the gallons per minute against what they call total dynamic head which has nothing to do with the height of the building this has to do with the resistance to flow as the water moves through the pipe so it shows you on the curve that as the resistance gets lower on this side the flow rate will go higher so if we begin to close valves that increases the resistance and the gallons per minute flowing will slow down by moving up this curve so GPM versus resistance to flow and if I was looking at that pump curve that we just looked at or that pump with the 23 feet ahead if we drew an arrow across here we're in it to six with the pump curve and then go down we might find that that pumps moving 100 gallons per minute now as we begin to throttle that by closing valves it'll move up this way and now you'll see that the head increases dramatically but the flow rate slows down as well so as we throttle down on a circulator it builds pressure that's on a single speed circulator and this is often why you'll have zone valves that bang or you'll have velocity noise as the water moves too too, too fast to the system all of this is cured in modern times by by uh, smart pumps that have ECM motors on them because the pump will just automatically find itself anywhere in this slice of pie here it'll just drift around until it finds exactly what you need and it'll do that without building pressure so that's modern times but this is a single speed circulator uh, which brings me to this guy this this is a two horsepower high speed circulator and and uh, there was a story behind this because when I was very young and just starting out working for the manufacturer's rep they would send me out uh, to help contractors because I had done a lot of research. You know, I'm not an engineer, but I'm a but I'm a reader, and and I did a lot of reading and a lot of a lot of um, research, and and I went out to help this contractor who had this pump, not this exact pump, but it was a different version of that pump. And uh, we're on the job, and he says to me, "This pump's making a lot of noise." He says, "I think we need a I think we need a new pump." And I said, "Well, well, maybe maybe it's just you know got the wrong size impeller in it or something, or it's oversized." so he says boy you really know your stuff and I was like 24 years old I think I, th I think he was like 25 years old he says you sure we don't need a new pump I said well let's see let's try something and we'll find out so on a pump like this you got a tapping right here that's for a gauge that's on the suction side and another tapping over here that's on the discharge side this this tapping is to vent the air out of the out of the volute this is the volute the impellers inside here the mechanical seal is back here and it's all motor over here no coupling so I put a gauge on there on the job and I put a gauge on there but but this was in a mechanical room so so follow the sequence of this he thinks I'm very smart so I go in there I, I shut off the power to the circulator I turn off the valves to the circulator I open this port I put a gauge in there another gauge in there I open the valves and I start the circulator and, and it gives me a reading and I, I get the uh, the differential pressure across the pump and I take that to a pump curve and I said to the guy this pump is so oversized that's why it's making noise it's called velocity noise so he says you mean we don't need a new pump I said no I don't think so I said usually we could just put in a smaller impeller in here which will cut down on the amount of of uh, flow and, and I said in this case the pump is so grossly oversized we could probably just leave the impeller out and just run it on the shaft key and he says Are you serious I said no I'm joking but uh, but thanks for <laughs> thanks for considering it so so he says boy you're really smart he says I've got some more questions to ask you so I said well okay let me let me first get my gauges back and we'll step outside where it's quieter so again follow the sequence I turned off the motor I closed the valves I took my gauges back from these points I, I put the ports back uh, the plugs back in the in the ports and uh, and I stood up and I I started the pump again and uh, we stepped outside now if you're following closely you're, you're going to notice that I missed the the uh, the part about about the opening the valves I, I forgot to open the valves so we're standing outside this mechanical room for, for no kidding what was no more than seven minutes and the guy the guy's just basking in my brilliance and asking me all these questions and I hear behind me inside this room this this violent explosion and he says to me <laughs> what was that and in that horrible moment I knew what it was because I had read about this in a book but but I said to him uh, 
I have no idea, which, which is exactly what you would have said under the same circumstances. So we open the door and I look inside uh, the boiler room and this this cast iron volute is gone. It's, it's gone, it's in pieces, it's stuck in a cinder block wall. The impeller is spinning in space. And the guy looks at me and he says, didn't I tell you we needed a new pump? So I said, you're right. And I sold him a new pump, which is exactly what you would have done under those circumstances. So I, I tucked my tail between my legs. I, I went back to, uh, to my office and, and we had an old engineer that worked for us. He was an old merchant marine guy. His name was Walter Bosch. And Walter was, was a guy who, uh, who was comical because he could not get through a sentence without dropping the F-bomb. I mean, this, this guy was an old sailor and, and he, he, he cursed better than anybody I've ever heard in my life. And, and he chewed me a new one It was when I told him what I did. And he says to me, don't you realize the amount of heat energy that gets built up when you run a circulator with the valves closed? I said, well, I, I do now. It's, it's, it was enough to make cast iron explode. He says, yeah. He says, let me show you a formula that I got at a, at that a seminar I went to years ago that was being taught by a pump expert. And this, this is the formula that shows the temperature rise in degrees Fahrenheit per minute. And all you got to do is figure out uh, this, this is a standard 5.1 factor times the, the brake horsepower which is, which is where on a pump curve, it shows at zero, where the pump curve reaches zero GPM. That's the brake horsepower at shut off. And into that, you divide the amount of water that's inside the pump, the volute volume in gallons, it's times the specific gravity and the specific heat of, of the fluid. In this case, it was water. So we went through this and he gave me an example. And he said, if I had a 40 horsepower pump with 200 feet of three inch pipe attached to it, and I ran it you know, with, with all that water and just ran it, with, with one valve closed where the water couldn't actually move, he says, I would see a, a temperature rise of 590 degrees in eight hours. He says, that would cause the paint to melt on the, on the pump. He says, now, young man, uh, the, the, the pump that you just blew up is a two horsepower end suction high speed pump. He says, when you run that with the valves closed, you're going to experience a 1,590 degree Fahrenheit rise in one hour. So within seven minutes, you could see how high we got. It was it was hot enough to make the pump blow up. So I learned a lesson, and uh, I never did that again, and I never closed the valves on a, on a pump again while it was running. And I encourage you to feel the same way about this. And if you ever have to throttle a, a, a pump that's oversized, by all means, use a throttling valve, but on the discharge of the pump, never throttle the suction side, because if you throttle the suction side, you're going to get a phenomenon called cavitation. This is what happens when the circulator tries to throw out more than it can pull in. So what happens then is, is the pressure here at the eye drops so severely that you'll get vapor. It's not steam because we're not adding BTUs to it. All the valves are open. We're not heating the water. It, it is, is actual vapor that forms because the water can't stay liquid. It's, it's actually in a vacuum. So you get a vapor bubble that forms and gets thrown out to the outer edge where the pressure is high. So suddenly this vapor bubble that formed here collapses out here and so it's it's water that suddenly leaves a hole in the water and and the hole is filled with other water and the water comes in at astonishing speeds and smashes into the edges of the impeller and just destroys the impeller and that's called cavitation and it looks like this in real life so this is supposed to be solid out to the edge here all of this was eaten up by cavitation and and in in real life it sounds like you're pumping gravel and if, if you want to hear this in real life, just to, if you have a swimming pool, or, or better yet, if your neighbor has a swimming pool, uh, go over to the pool skimmer there and take a beach ball and just stuff it in so, while, the, while the filter pump is running and listen to what happens. Because the filter pump is going to immediately begin to cavitate as it throws out more than, more than it can suck in. And if you're lucky, you'll even see the hose going to the suction side collapse as it goes into vacuum. So don't do that on your own house. Do it on your neighbor's. So when we talk about pump head, we're not talking about the height because like a Ferris wheel, the weight of the car going over, up over here is balanced by the weight of the car coming down over here. In a hot water heating system, we use a fill valve to fill the system completely to the top and put it under a few pounds of pressure. So there's no lifting involved because the weight of the water going up is balanced by the weight of the water coming down. So when a circulator comes on, it's very much like the motor on a Ferris wheel in that it's not doing any lifting at all. It's just turning this big wheel of water. And that's how we heat the building. So when we say pump head, we're not talking about height. We're not talking about the size of the building. If you had a 10-story building and you put in a circulator and then you laid the building on its side, it would use the same exact circulator because the piping hasn't changed. 
So with that in mind, let's talk about the circulator's relationship to this compression tank and go back to that discovery that Gil Carlson made when all those boilers were dissolving through oxygen corrosion. I want you to imagine that we've got a loop of piping and a compression tank with 12 pounds of air pressure on this side of it and a circulator. So we're going to remove the boiler. We're going to take out everything extraneous because I just want you to focus on the relationship between this circulator and this tank. We filled it with exactly 10 gallons of water. It's sealed to the atmosphere. Nothing else can get in. Nothing else can get out. So we've got 10 gallons of water in the pipe, in the pump, and in the tank. When the circulator comes on, it's going to throw out what's at the side of itself, and that's going to make this big wheel of water turn like that. And everything is going to move at the same instant. There's no lead lag here. It's like moving one link on a bicycle chain. You move one link, the whole chain moves at the same time. So the question then becomes, when this water is moving around, can any of this water enter this tank? When the circulator comes on, can it push water into the tank? Now think about that for a minute, because I know you're probably thinking that that's possible. You're probably thinking that the force of the, of the pump is going to shove water into the tank. But while you're thinking about that, I want you to remember that we've only got 10 gallons of water to work with. And if we take any water out of this pipe and add it to the tank, we're going to be left with a hole where the water used to be. And since water is not stretchable like taffy, there's nothing that's going to fill in that hole. So we could say, in terms of real-world physics, that when a circulator and a hydronic system operates, it is impossible for that circulator to put a drop of water into that tank because that would leave behind a pure vacuum, which can't happen. So the circulator runs, no water goes into that tank. Now, let's move the circulator over here so that we're pumping away from this point. And again, it's the exact same system, 10 gallons of water. When the circulator runs, it's going to make the big wheel of water turn like that, just like a Ferris wheel. And the question then is, as the water is moving, can it draw by a Venturi action water out of the tank to enter this flow? And if you think about that for a minute, you may like the idea that water is going to suck out of the tank and up into the flow. But then once you start to think a little bit more, you realize that water is not compressible. So if the pipe is completely filled with water when we start out, we can't take any water out of the tank. There's no place to put it. The pipe is already full. Well, you can't squeeze water. It's not compressible. So we could say with great assurance that when a circulator runs, it cannot remove a drop of water from that tank. So it can't put water into the tank, and it can't take water out of the tank. And because of this, Gil Carlson back in the 60s called the tank the point of no pressure change. This was a major breakthrough in the science of hydronic heating. He said that the circulator will respond to the point of no pressure change. This is like a hydronic bookmark. This will never vary. If we fill it at 12 pounds, unless we heat the water, if we heat the water, it's going to expand and squeeze the air cushion. But if we don't heat the water, if we're just looking at the circulator, the pressure here will be a continuous whatever we set it at, in this case, 12 pounds. So if I pump away from it, the circulator is going to add its differential pressure to the 12 pounds. But if I pump toward it, the circulator is going to subtract its differential pressure from this because it can't make the pressure here any greater than 12 pounds. So this is, this is in charge. The tank is in charge, not the circulator when it comes to what the pressures are going to do. So here's an example of that. Let's say the point of no pressure change, PONPC, is 12 pounds right here. And I'm going to use a little circulator here, something like you'd have in your house. This is a small water lubricated circulator. And when you have that, it produces about six pounds of differential pressure. So this will always stay at 12. So this is six plus 12. There'll be 18 pounds of pressure here. And the water will flow around the big wheel, like moving a Ferris wheel. Now, let's move the circulator over here so that it's seeing half of the system pressure drop on its supply side and the other half of the system pressure drop on its return side. Let's see what happens. Now we're going to see the same 6 psi differential, but it's going to be split in half. Instead of going up to 18, we only go up by 3 to 15. And instead of staying at 12, we drop to 9, which represents the 3 psi pressure drop along this run. Got it? OK. Now let's move it back here so we're pumping directly at the point of no pressure change, which can never be any more than 12. Move the circulator to there. It comes on, this stays at 12. It produces a 6 psi dis differential by dropping its suction pressure by 6. So now the circulator comes on. Consider this for a minute. We just removed half the system pressure. It's gone. What used to be 12 is now 6. And that's down in the basement where the boiler is. Imagine what's going on on the top floor radiators that may have some air bubbles in them. 
if you remove this pressure, suddenly the pressure on the air bubbles also drops. So the air bubbles, when you remove pressure, the bubbles get bigger, right? That's, that's Boyle's law. You remove pressure on a gas, it's going to get bigger. You, you add pressure to a gas, it's going to get smaller. So this was what was causing the corrosion of the boilers back in the 60s, and the engineers realized it, and they moved those big pumps to the supply side. But it never really caught on until recent years in the minds of the people that do residential work and like commercial work. But this is what's causing your air problems. So here's an example in a, in a long, low warehouse. We've got a ceiling-mounted tank here. There's the boiler. And in this case, we're going to put a circulator here. And this is like a two horsepower inline circulator. And let's say that circulator can produce 13 PSI differential pressure or about 30 feet of pump head. Now, when it comes on, if I'm filling the system here with uh, 12 pounds of pressure at the point of no pressure change, which is where the tank connects to the boiler, 12 PSI plus 13 PSI is going to give me 25 PSI. And that's what you'll see here when the circulator comes on and runs. And everything's fine. The big wheel of water will turn. You've got a positive pressure. All's good. Now let's move this circulator down here and see what happens. I'm going to put it down here, pumping right at that point of no pressure change. Now the point of no pressure change is still the same. It's still 12. And the circulator hasn't changed. It's still producing 13 PSI differential pressure. But watch what happens when the circulator's ability to produce pressure exceeds the system fill pressure. Suddenly we have a case of 12 minus 13 which is minus one PSI. And that's equivalent to two inches of mercury vacuum. And that's what you'll have inside that pipe when the circulator runs. So what's going to happen immediately is the mechanical seal is going to start to suck air in through itself. And also, if this is a high point and somebody installs an automatic air vent there, well, air is going to come into the system right through that automatic air vent because it'll be sub-atmospheric. So air comes flooding through here hits the boiler, rots the boiler, and gets spit out of an air separator on the supply side. And this was, the, this was the tragedy that they were facing in the 60s before they moved those circulators to the supply pipe, pumping away from the compression tank. Back to a small boiler. Here's, here's a common, common mistake. The circulator gets installed on a return because of habit, because that's the way my grandfather used to do it, for whatever reason. You put it down there, and you're going to bring the fill valve in right to the suction side of the circulator. Because again, it's easy to pipe that way. Up here, we've got the compression tank, the air separator, and the, and the main air vent. So that's point of no pressure change. That's 12 PSI. Down over here, we've got a 12-pound feed valve. And over here, you've got 6 pounds differential when the circulator comes on. So it comes on. It may increase the pressure by maybe 1 pound as it flows through the boiler before it meets the point of no pressure change. But the balance of this differential pressure is going to show up as a drop in pressure on the suction side over here. So when the circulator runs, suddenly you've got 7 PSI here. That's what's inside the system. This is a 12-pound feed valve. So high pressure goes to low pressure. So when the 12-pound feed valve sees 7 pounds, it will feed. And you might think that it will feed every single time the circulator runs, but that's not the case. It's only going to do this once. It's going to do this on the very first cycle. This drops to 7. This feeds, bringing the overall system pressure up to about 17 or 18 PSI. And then it's going to stop, and the next time the circulator starts, it'll drop the pressure down to 12 again. So the feed won't go below 12. It'll stay there. But And you think, well, what's the big deal? I'm operating at 18 pounds instead of 12. No big deal. My relief valve is set to pop at 30. That can't hurt me. But you know what? You're, you're wrong. It can hurt you. Because when you size a compression tank, one of the things you take into consideration, actually several of the things, you, you have to know the volume of water in the system in gallons. You have to know the average water temperature that you're going to be operating at, which is probably 170 degrees Fahrenheit. And you also have to know the difference in pressure between the fill valve setting and the relief valve pop-off. So normally it's 12 over here and on the relief valve 30. When you increase the feed valve by 50%, your required compression tank size doubles. So if this was, say, an Amtrol number 15 tank, suddenly you need a 30. The 15 is half the size that you need. So you might start having problems with your relief valve popping because your compression tank suddenly is not big enough, and, and it's not big enough solely because of where you installed your feed valve. So this is a very common problem. You see it every day in life. There's the feed valve up there. Look where it's going in, right into the suction side of the circulator. So this guy's going to have a problem. He's going to be changing tanks or putting in oversized tanks and wasting money and leaving the profit on the job when it should be in his own pocket. Don't get sucked into that.
I wrote a book called Pumping Away years ago, and, and, uh, and I wrote it with the contractor in mind, because the only one that really benefits from this is the contractor. And the boiler manufacturers got a little upset with me because they were mounting the circulators on the return, and they said, Dan, you know, if we move the circulator to the supply, uh, we've got to change our literature, our packing information, our, you know, our, our procedure on the, on the assembly line, and we wouldn't sell any more boilers. I said, well, why don't you just leave the circulator in the box? And they said, no, you know, because then the contractor is going to think, you know, why don't I just buy my own circulator? We're making a lot of money on the circulator. So it was a human problem. So, so one boiler company came out with a drawing that said, we're going to put the circulator on the return, as we always did. But uh, to keep in compliance with, with the laws of physics, install your compression tank on the suction side of the circulator and you'll be fine. And, you know, that, that was true because look what happens here. If that's the point of no pressure change and it's 12 PSI and you're pumping away from that, and your circulator comes on and it can produce 6 PSI, you'll see 18 over here. And with a single circulator, this is perfectly acceptable. But, but we don't use single circulators in most cases. We zone. And if we zone with circulators, we've got this other circulator involved here. So now watch what happens, because one is pumping away from the tank and the other one is pumping toward the tank. So we set up a situation where this happens. This circulator is off and this one is on. Now, when this one is on, it makes 18 pounds of pressure. This stays at 12, and everything's fine. You got flow. Over here, when this guy is off and this guy is on, you might get a slight rise in pressure to reflect the difference in, uh, you know, the pressure drop across this piping here. But the majority of the pressure is going to show up as drop in pressure over here. And as long as this one is on by itself, this zone will work fine too. But on a really cold day, when all the zones are on, that's when this happens. Both of them are on. This guy is producing 13 PSI on its outlet side. This one's producing 18. And keep in mind, I'm leaving out the flow control valves that, are, that would be in part of this, so, which is a check valve. So if this is a check valve with 13 PSI trying to open it and 18 PSI forcing it closed, you're going to have a situation where there's heat in this zone and no heat in that zone. And when you go out on this troubleshooting call, I guarantee you, you're going to start bleeding radiators and you're going to start purging lines. And you're not going to see any air. And remember what I taught you earlier, if you don't get any air, it ain't an air problem, so stop the bleeding.